Hi everyone. Thank you for joining this session. My name is Nava Levy and I'm going to be talking about how vector similarity search and generative AI can help you build smart applications. Now, in the past year, we saw, I think, uh, two things that are amazingly exciting. The first one is that AI became much more powerful, much more applicable to many more use cases, thanks to generative AI and applications like ChatGPT. And the, the other thing is that it became much more accessible, not just to the mass, you know, uh, to our kids or our, or our grandparents, but also to uh, software developers. And now software developers can create smart application in hours, in, in days, where in the past it used to take months or even a year or more and required a lot of resources and a lot of data science expertise. So this is really an, an inflection point. And it's very exciting times. Uh, so this is my topic. It's based on uh, one of the talks that I gave in the past year, specifically a talk that I gave at Geekle AI and Software Development Conference. And I updated it to reflect the uh, current uh, changes, uh, improvements. This domain is really progressing very fast. So anything that you prepared a few months ago is already a bit outdated. So I try to also update it and I'll mention where it's relevant. So we'll start with introduction and setting the context. Then we'll talk about AI for software developers, how to build smart apps with AI. So again, AI is no longer the domain of data scientists and machine learning engineers only, but also software developers can create smart apps without much data science and machine learning expertise. And we'll conclude with summary and next step. And if we we'll have time, the, the talk will be about one hour I'll discuss one of the questions that keeps coming up. Will AI take over our jobs and specifically software developers' jobs and do a discussion about that? So how is AI transforming software development? There are two aspects. The first one, software development productivity gains. So here we see like an image of AI pair programming, a, a software developer, a human software developer programming side by side with an AI. So this is an illustration. Actually, I created it with one of the generative AI applications like DALI. And the, the other implication is developing smart applications. Again, no longer the domain of just data scientists. And this will be the focus of our presentation. We will explore the techniques, tools, and frameworks that are enabling every developer to infuse AI into her applications, him or her applications. Now, uh, I'll be sharing some uh, uh, code, code snippets, uh, APIs that will allow you to develop uh, your own application very quickly. Uh, all these uh, code snippets that I'll be sharing during the talk will be on a Colab, Colab notebook, whoever isn't familiar, Google Colab notebook that I will share at the end of the presentation, which I also used for the Geekel AI software development uh, talk. Okay. So AI for everyone, the power of foundation models for LLM, large language models, and generative AI, like ChatGPT, in the palm of every developer heads, okay? Um, so this is something that is completely new. It's in, in the past, let's say, year, okay, or so, and it's becoming a more and more and more uh, simpler to develop or to, in, to inject AI into a software application. So let's first see why do we want to inject AI into our software application and, and how it was before, let's say uh, more than a year ago or three or four or five years ago. So first of all, level set, deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. Now, large language models are deep learning models, okay? Transformers are deep learning models. Generative AI is also a part of deep learning. So anything that you know or heard about relating to deep learning, you know, the, um, the, the huge models, the, the tens of millions of dollars you need uh, to, to train such models, to create such models, the enormous data sets are, relate, are, are also applicable to generative AI and large language model. Now, why is deep learning so special? It's because it, the architecture, okay, it tries to mimic how our brain uh, works with artificial neural networks, okay? Mimics are, are the neurons in our brain organized in many deep layers. So if you see here in the illustration, there is the input layer 
there is the output layer. In between, there are hidden layers. Now, these hidden layers, and usually there are many hidden layers, not just three, as you can see here, allow the model to capture complex relationships, complex patterns in the data, non-linear uh, relationship, which is very important when we deal with unstructured data. Unstructured data, images, text, okay, like chats. And this is uh, uh, why um, deep learning is so powerful uh, for these type of applications. It's, it powers, it in the past and today, amazing innovations, mostly coming from large companies. So if it's Google Translate, if it's a co-pilot for coding, if it's self-driving cars, if it's semantic search, not just full text, full text search or keyword search, if, of course, ChatGPT, uh, creating images, image recognitions, all this is, is uh, enabled by enormous models, sometimes called foundation models, uh, that cost millions or tens of millions of dollars uh, to create. Um, now, um, when we um, insert or inject AI into our software applications, we are leveraging these amazing, powerful foundation models. And how could it be? I mean, why should, uh, how could it be that a company that invested tens of millions of dollars, years in developing, a foundation model, we can just use it and leverage uh, it for our own use case. So this is really the reality today. Uh, all of this is being democratized or made accessible to software developers, even without machine learning expertise or tons of resources. And here are the, the steps or the journey that we have seen in the past several years on the way to uh, democratizing AI, making it accessible to everyone. So. First, open source pre-trained machine learning models and model repositories. Those huge models that I just mentioned earlier are being open sourced and, and placed in, in repositories uh, that we can just use for free. It's amazing, right? Uh, then we can take each uh, model, okay, the model that we selected, and we can fine tune it with and uh, fine tune the large a machine learning model, this pre-trained model that was already trained with supervised learning on our data, on much smaller set of data for our specific task, okay? So this is the, the cool thing about uh, the first step, and we'll talk a little bit about that. This, this existed for several years now, okay? Um, so we have the data, unstructured data, maybe it's text, images, speech, and we, it goes through training and we have the foundation model. So foundation model is really a, a, a very large, complex mathematical formula. And when we train the model, we find the parameters of this mathematical formula, okay? The weights, sometimes called. And now we can take this foundation model that, thanks to the good uh, will of those companies who share those foundation models and open source, and adapt them to our own use cases. Maybe it's question answering, sentiment analysis, uh, object recognition, instruction following, uh, uh, etc. Now, one of the common ways of, uh, of transferring the learning from the foundation model is by generating an embedding on your own data. You run an image or, or a paragraph of text through the foundation model, and you generate an embedding. An embedding is basically a, a vector of numbers, floating numbers. Maybe it's 1,000 or 2,000 numbers, maybe more, maybe less. And not only you can find it on your own data with just you know hundreds of samples or maybe th only thousands of samples, you can also, uh, not just for specific task, but also for specific domain. Maybe it's finance, finance or healthcare or agriculture. So uh, you could see that uh, the, the, this is the vector of numbers. This is, these are only, I think, six numbers. So the dimension is, uh, is six, but uh, usually a, an embedding vector is much, much uh, higher dimension. Um, so you, we can generate embeddings, and this is the magic. That's why you have the magic wand here on the left. You can generate embeddings for any object, any modality. Modality means it can be text, audio, image, okay? Uh, and and the uh, object, you know, it, in, instead of uh, uh, audio, it could be the noise from an engine, it could be speech, it could be music. Um, and uh, we can leverage open source 
pre trained models. We can also leverage uh, today uh, open AI APIs or Cohere doesn't have to be just open source, also co could be commercial, but it started with the open source pre trained models from repositories such as Image to Vec, which was the first one uh, for uh, computer vision, uh, Kagel, which used to be TensorFlow Hub, they moved just uh, a month ago all the models, 2,000 models to Kaggle. And of course, Hugging Face, which is by far the largest one. Uh, now, uh, why is it important to have these repositories? The reason is that there are many, many uh, amazing models. And every day there is a new paper, a new model that is published. So it's very uh, difficult to keep track and to know which model is relevant for your use case. Um, is, is, it, is it the right modality, you know, um, text or image? Is it the right task? Is it um, the right domain, finance or healthcare? Uh, does the data, the data set that it was trained of, does it have as inherent biases? Okay, how much, uh, what is the size of, of the model? Um, is it large? Is, is the, will, will it be costly to run? Would, would, it, would it have delay, latency? Okay, all of these factors matter. So these repositories, and here we have from Hugging Face, allow, allow you to make all these uh, decisions and to find those models very, very easily. So you could see here, this is just going to the Hugging Face uh, uh, homepage. Uh, you can see that you can choose the, the, um, um, the modality. Is it a multimodal? It's, let's say, text and image. Is it just computer vision? So it could be video or image. Is it LLM, large language models, which is text? Maybe it's audio. So you find the modality and then you select the, the, the task. So for audio, it could be text to audio, text to speech. It could be um, speaker recognition. It could be language recognition, okay? It could, it could be so many things. Uh, and you select the task that you would like. Uh, and the closer the task is to your own use case, the easier it will be to fine tune, or maybe you don't need to fine tune at all. And you can use it as is and will for, let's say, vector similarity search, and I will address it uh, soon. Now, of course, there is also benchmarks and leaderboards this, that are also very useful uh, to determine which is the model that also has the best performance, for instance. Now, you can see here on Hugging Fest, there are today almost half a million models. A year and a half ago, it was only 50,000, okay? So you could see how fast this domain is growing. Now, the problem uh, with this amazing technique is that it's not as easy as the techniques that I'm going to talk about uh, in the next uh, um, 50 minutes or so. Um, the, the level of difficulty, as I would say, is um, medium to hard. It takes between six months to a year to do it. And you do need, let's say, uh, between hundreds to thousands of samples. So it's, the, it's not as easy as the other techniques, but it's much, much, much easier than creating a foundation model from scratch yourself, which will require much longer, tens of millions of dollars or more. Now, the next uh, uh, technique is vector embeddings for vector similarity search. As I mentioned, vector embeddings became very, very uh, popular over the, the past several years for transfer learning for specific tasks. It's actually the internal language that the AI the model, the, the, or for instance, a large language model, which a foundation model, uh, uh, talks uh, um, between the different layers. So the, the hidden layers that I spoke earlier, they pass from one layer to another embeddings. And if we take the embeddings from the last uh, layer or one of the last layer, we can transfer a lot of the learnings to uh, other models, smaller models, for downstream task like sentiment analysis, translation, or summarization in the case of large language model. Um, vector embeddings are the native language of foundation models and deep learning models, the machine learning models that underpin generative AI capabilities. So once vector embeddings became, you know, uh, more popular and accessible, they weren't used just for uh, training, for, for, for uh, fine tuning a model, but also for vector similarity search in production. So if we have an example of a word 
טקסט, אז יש איזה דומיין אוף NLP, Natural Language Processing, או LLM, Large Language Models, We run the world through an embedder, embedding generator, a machine learning model, and we generate an embedding, which as I said is a vector of numbers. Now, to generate an embedding, even though we are using a model that may have taken a year or two years to develop and uh, tens of millions of dollars and tons of data, we can use it almost for free or almost for free with just one or two lines of code. So the APIs are very, very simple. You, you, here is an example from Transformers library of Hugging Face, and this is from the OpenAI uh, API. Okay, so it's very, very easy to create uh, those embeddings. And now those embeddings, the vector embedding that don't, that don't mean much to us as humans. Those numbers, we don't know what they represent. They make sense to the model, but not to us as humans. Like 0.62, we don't know what it means. It doesn't it mean it's an object and not an animal. It doesn't mean it's female and not male. What, what, what does it mean? We don't know what, what it means, but they do have a special characteristic, vector embeddings, that if we map them on the vector space, then similar objects in the real life are closer to each other in the vector space. So if puppy, puppy and dog are similar objects in the real life, right? Then you can see here that they are closer to each other in the vector space. And we can, can take advantage of this property by, by calculating the distance between those two vectors. And we know if the distance is small, those objects are similar. So puppy and dog is much more similar compared to house and dog, okay? And so the use cases for this are, you know, lots and lots of use cases. Uh, semantic search, Q&A bots, matching engine, sentiment analysis, recommendation. So it could be... Uh, product recommendations in a catalog based on text, and it could be recommendations based on image. It's, it's, a, it's a, a shirt similar to the shirt uh, that I just uploaded. And, and from the catalog, it will offer me, the, let's say, the top three shirts that are most similar to the one that I am looking for. And if it's a query, a, a free text query, then again, I will generate an embedding to the query and I will generate an embedding to each one of the items in the product catalog, and I will look for the um, top 10 or top three, depends on what, what I selected, with the most similar uh, items in the catalog. It's also good for use cases such as fraud detection, deduplication, content moderation, anomaly, anomaly detection. So this is the opposite of the left side. Here, when we find something that is more similar, we remove it, we protect ourselves against it, like, if, if it's deduplication, two products in a catalog are too similar, then we delete one of them. If it's a content moderation, let's say for an image, and the image is a bad image, it's similar to other bad images, then we do not allow it to be uploaded into our social network application. Uh, if, and if its transaction is, is uh, too similar to other fraudulent transactions, then we uh, don't approve it, etc., etc. Now, if it's a real-time use case, then all of this has to be done in split seconds. And when the um, number of items in the catalog or number of the item in the, in the against the you want a search, let's say it's millions or billions, then that's not trivial at all. And that's why you need something that is called a vector database. Now, um, the, one of the key elements of this to work well is the model, the, the, the embedding generator, the machine learning model that does the embeddings. So there are benchmark and leaderboards. Here we can see that Mistral is one of the top ones for uh, Instruct, for chat. And uh, there are many considerations for selecting a machine learning model, if it's for a specific tax, like to chat, or for um, for uh, embedding generator. And so it could be, um, what is the size of it? Uh, of course, the performance leaderboards usually uh, uh, rank the models per, per the performance, how accurate it is, okay, that it gives the relevant, uh, um, relevant results for, for your task. But it's also, you have other consideration, how big it is. If it's too big, then it will be costly to run and it might be slow, so performance won't be great. Um, so you need, you need to have a trade-off between uh, what is your use case and uh, what are your needs. 
And, and you will see that today the models are so good that you really can compromise on less performance in terms of accuracy to get smaller models uh, because they are more cost efficient to run and have better performance. So this is Mistral and they are a, a new uh, startup that uh, publish uh, open uh, models and uh, the, the most uh, recent model from uh, Mixtral from a month ago uh, is as good as ChatGPT uh, uh, or 3.5, GPT 3.5, okay? And this is really uh, mind-blowing because when ChatGPT was launched, it was based on GPT 3.5 and this is when it got those, uh, you know, so many uh, users uh, so fast. So GPT 3.5 is really good for, for many, many use cases. Uh, here we can see the, the next runner-up. It's um, a tenth or less than a tenth of the size, so it probably is more cost-effective uh, cost uh, to run and with better performance. Uh, by the way, text embedding ADA is number 23 in this particular leaderboard, uh, but it still can be good. Um, for instance, um, if your use case isn't uh, so complicated and there are other open source models, even with, let's say, uh, sm even smaller, if, if, uh, for OpenAI, the, the size isn't relevant because it's an API, it's hosted on OpenAI, but, but, but embedding, really, you can, uh, you can take really small embedding uh, generator and they are still very good, so you really need to check your own use case. Now, also what's important is the embedding dimension. So for instance, some vector databases, if it's above 1,000 or 24, they can't accommodate it. So uh, in some vector databases, they can, they can address any, of the, um, any size. But again, if the size is too long, it will take up more space in your vector database. It will cost more, the performance will be worse. So it's a trade-off. Uh, here we, we can see another leaderboard, and there are, you know, there are more than one leaderboard. And uh, if we see the number one uh, in terms of uh, performance, um, we, here it's a slide from a few months ago. It's a, it's a screenshot. You can see it had 2 million uh, downloads that month. But I looked uh, earlier at Hugging Face at this model card. It's a model card. Every model on Hugging Face has a model card with lots of important information. It had 8 million downloads. So all, all this domain is becoming more and more uh, popular. You can see how to use the embeddings. You can see lots of properties. And you can even test run it on Hugging Face. So if you have sentences in your own domain and you can see, want to see that the similarity, it tests the similarity cleverly, then it's very uh, easy uh, to do that. We can see here that the source sentence is, this is a happy person, and it compares the sentence to, that is a happy dog, this is a very happy person, and today is a sun, sunny day, what is the bus uh, station? And the similarity for, um, just a second, the similarity uh, scores, uh, the highest one were, this is a very happy person. So the higher is the more similar, cosine similarity, so 0.967, is the most similar sentence, and we can, we can see that it is the most similar sentence. Um, okay, uh, this is another um, model card for another, uh, for another uh, uh, model. Again, you can test drive it, it's for Q&A, how many people li live in London. You can check it on against the similarity against many, many answers, maybe a million answers, and you can see that the right answer got the best score. Around 9 million people live in London. Here we can see real-world use cases in productions uh, that are AI-powered uh, uh, with vector databases using vector similarities. So KU, a social network uh, platform in, in India, they, they have the safest and friendliest social network. They use vector database for content moderation. So if somebody wants to upload an image that is a bad image, they use vector similarity search to determine if this is a, a bad image or not. A Gitbook, a de technical documentation platform for as Q&A bot. Now this isn't ChatGPT, it's a Q&A bot. The answers are also uh, already written, but you will use vector similarity to present the most relevant answer to the question. Um, 
recommendation from uh, Superlinks, a personalized engine infra infrastructure, perception points for threat prevention uh, platform, and WooCommerce for the e-commerce website platform for semantic and le lexical search. So they combine semantic search, which takes the meaning of the query, not just the keywords, with lexical search, which takes the keywords into account. So it's a kind of a hybrid search. All of these use cases are leveraging vector database to store the embeddings and perform vector similarity search. Now, also for vector databases, there are benchmarks and leaderboards. And here you can see one benchmark, there are many, uh, by Gina AI uh, that uh, uh, compared the performance versus the accuracy of several vector databases. And you can see that uh, in terms of accuracy, how relevant the results are, versus performance, Redis has the most, uh, uh, the, bet, the, uh, the best performance, so higher is better, okay? But this, this is one, um, one uh, benchmark, there are other benchmarks, and for your own use cases, uh, the, it might be different, uh, different considerations that are more important for you, so you should always uh, create a proof of concept and compare it to, you know, a few, uh, a few, a few models if it's a machine learning model or a few vector databases, uh, whatever the case is. Now, the ecosystem, <coughs> the ecosystem for neural or vector uh, search or vector search pyramids, it's adapted from Dimitri Khan blog. So on the bottom, we have the KNN, K nearest neighbor algorithms or LNN, approximate nearest neighbor algorithms. The difference is, that KNN is, uh, is regarded as a brute force algorithm. It checks against uh, every vector. So if you have a query and you, have, you generated an embedding for this query, you can compare the similarity to every vector in your database. And you'll get uh, the most similar one. Or you can do an approximation. You'll, you'll check the similarity against an index, which is much more uh, cost effective. The performance is much higher. And this is what normally is being used, like HNSW and others. Now, vector databases, I named several vector databases that are out there. Some are open source, some are proprietary. Some come from startups, and, and this is what they are mo mostly or only focused on. And some come from more established databases, that a vector database is one of the um, offering that they, or capabilities that they, uh, are offered. Uh, and if you're already familiar with uh, the, the APIs, and uh, so maybe this is the way to go. Uh, neural search frameworks um, uh, are very important because they abstract the complexities of the layers below, and uh, they bring for developers the time to market for uh, innovations, for applications is much faster. So Haystack, Gina AI, Relevance AI, Vectra, etc. Embedding models, and some would argue that maybe these are the most important because without embedding models, none of this magic would be possible. So we have many, uh, OpenAI text embedding ADA, BERT, CLIP, and you saw uh, many others that I showed before on the leaderboards. Embedding model repositories. So TensorFlow Hub is now Kaggle. The models move, were moved to, to Kaggle. Hugging face, uh, which is the leader. Uh, application business logic as a user interface. Now, the, as I mentioned, the neural search frameworks make it much easier for software developers to bring applications to the market. So in terms of uh, a difficulty, I would say that uh, embedding with, very, with vector similarity search is a medium difficulty, much, much less difficult compared to fine-tuning with classic supervised learning. But with neural f uh, search frameworks, it's even easier. It's, it's like easy, I would say. Um, the next is developer-friendly LLM APIs, large language models APIs, like OpenAI uh, GPT, okay? Prompt engineering with LLM. So I'll talk about these two uh, that only uh, were possible uh, a year ago, since a year ago. Uh, Andros Karpasi from OpenAI uh, gave a talk, the state of GPT, uh, in Microsoft Build several months ago, and he said, and all of this power is accessible at your fingertips. So here's everything that's needed in terms of code to ask GPT a question, to prompt it, and get a response. 
Now, uh, you can see here the, the API. I just, he asked uh, ChatGPT uh, or GPT 3.5 uh, what uh, um, something, uh, something regarding Microsoft Build. I asked what are Geekle Conference because I use it for the talk uh, that I mentioned earlier at uh, the Geekle Conference. And this was the answer. So all of this with just a few lines of cost and almost free, free or almost free. It's amazing, right? Uh, in, the, in the Colab notebook, the Google Colab notebook that I will share, which is like a Google Docs, like a Jupyter notebook uh, in Google Drive, very similar to Google Docs in terms of how easy it is to use and share. Um, I will share two, uh, two APIs. One is for uh, inference model, uh, open, it's for open AI APIs. One is for inference one. So inference model, uh, it's it's for one interactions like please summarize this uh, page uh, what is the sentiment analysis of this image of this email okay is it is it is it uh, uh, angry is it is it uh, excited what is it extraction extract let's say keywords uh, from an email or um, um, extract a language uh, of the email Translate, translate a sentence or an email from one language to another. So all, each one of them is is one task, and uh, and it can be done in in inference mode using one uh, prompt. Where we and you can see the API here. Chat mode is very similar to ChatGPT. It remembers past interactions, uh, and it stores them as messages. And then the next interaction, it it answers based on those interactions. Okay, so this is the API for uh, chat mode. Um, temperature is a degree of randomness. Okay, it's, uh, this is how you set a degree of randomness. So if uh, it's important for you that uh, the answers will be factual, not without hallucination or minimum, minimal hallucination, uh, then you would set it as temperature equals zero. But if you, you actually want uh, creativity, let's say it's a, it's a creative uh, story writing use case, then of course uh, you will uh, you won't want it as zero. Um, this is from an uh, Android and G course building system with ChatGPT API. Uh, I uh, encourage you to do this course. Uh, uh, what he explains here he explains uh, what I said earlier that if uh, supervised learning fine tuning uh, a, a foundation model to your own task using supervised learning with hundreds or maybe thousands of samples, it's much much easier than it was before. It still takes between six to one year. It requires data scientists and machine learning engineers. While if you use prompt-based AI, which I'll show you uh, in, in a second what it is, then it can take minutes or hours, and I would say even days, you know, but still it's so little to create your use case. Um, so let's look at example for real-world sentiment analysis use case. So first one, determine if a customer review is positive or negative. So let's say there is a, a negative uh, customer review. Maybe you want to address it in the product. Maybe you want to uh, reach out to the customer. So it's, it's important to know those things uh, and vice versa. So the prompt, uh, I wanted a real world use case. So the pro, it's a broomstick review. Uh, it's the fastest model on the market. So it's a broomstick that allows you to fly, okay? And someone said it's the fastest model on the market. So is it a positive or negative review? So the prompt is, what is the sentiment of the following product review, which is delimited with triple brackets? Okay? Give your answer as a single word, either positive or negative. Review text and the boosting review, you have it defined there. And the response is positive. So that's a good uh, response and it's one, se one sentence so you can use it for your own application. Uh, alert, that's another use case. Alert when sentiment of customer support email is angry. So let's say the, 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 the support email is uh, still our boomstick review, okay? Uh, and so this time, make a response to output the value of anger as Boolean, e.g. anger equals true. And again, anger equals false because there is no anger. So note that we just saw a prompt that contains a sim simple example of constraint prompting. Because we can't have a, a ChatGPT just saying once 
Uh, no, it's it's uh, it's not negative. It's positive. And once pi, it'll say it is positive. And once it says positive, we want it to determine deterministic outcome. So we can use it for applications. This is an example how you you use constraint prompting, which is very important. OpenAI also has the functions to do it. But if you're using open source, it's good that you'll know how to do it using prompt engineering. Similarly, we can extract product names, infer top topics, summarize text, translate, copy, edit and other classic inference tasks with just simple promptings using the same model. So in the past, not only it took six to months to a year, it was, it was just to create one model for one task, like one trick pony, okay? So this is really amazing. Um, now, I wanted to show you something that uh, uh, today is possible that wasn't possible uh, a year ago. The previous uh, tasks were possible. They maybe took a year to develop and they were, weren't so cheap, but they were possible. Okay, so if you had a use case that was lucrative enough, you would invest a year and people did it often enough. Okay, and now I'm going to show you a, a use case that doesn't, uh, 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 isn't possible using the traditional methods. It's, it's only thanks to uh, large language models like ChatGPT and only was possible like in the past year or so. So let's say uh, I have a business it's a restaurant and I want, and it's a restaurant of th the three people operate it. I also have a website so people can order um, food from the website. And I also, some people prefer to talk to a person, you know, using chat or something, but uh, it's not cost effective for me to, to hire a person to do it. So I would like uh, to have a use case that does it to me automatically using something like ChatGPT or uh, maybe it's a startup that offers this service to businesses, look, you currently you don't have that, here I'll offer it to you very cheap. So, so how long would it take us to create such, a, a, such a, a use case? So I thought today it will take maybe, you know, weeks, two months or something like that. And, uh, and then, uh, so, so here is an example. Uh, the restaurant is the Jelly Beans restaurant at the Hogwarts Express. Again, real world use cases. And uh, the assistant is the AI. Uh, how can I assist today? And the user, maybe I'm the customer. Hi, I'd like to order jelly beans. Assistant, great. We have three flavors, flavors of jelly beans, chocolate, strawberry, and marshmallow. Which flavor would you like? The user, I'd like chocolate and strawberry jelly beans. Sure. What size would you like? We have large for 12.95 sickles, medium for 10 sickles, etc., etc. Okay, then it goes on and on um, to summarize. Uh, would, do you want it uh, a pickup uh, or uh, to be delivered? And if it's delivered, where are you located, etc., etc. So this is what I want. And you know what? This is actually uh, the output of something that uh, I created using uh, the following prompt, okay, that uh, instructs uh, ChatGPT like or the large language model, in this case it's uh, OpenAI, you are OrderBot, an automated service to collect orders for the Jelly Beans restaurants on ho the Hogwarts Express train. You first greet the student, then collect the order. If the student orders Jelly Beans, make sure to ask if she wants any toppings. Also, you can offer the student side dishes, etc., etc. Uh, make sure to clarify all options. You respond in a short, very conversation-friendly style. Okay? Then I have to add, and it, this is adapted from the pizza ordering demo on Andrew and G course Deep Learning AI and OpenAI, which I'll, uh, I'm rec I recommend to do, and, I'll, and I have links at the end for, uh, for these uh, courses. Now, I also put the menu. So uh, you can see here the menu. So you have the chocolate jelly beans, you have drinks, butter, beer, pumpkin juice, fire whiskey, etc., etc., and note prices above are in sickles, okay? So, um, so this is amazing, right? Just uh, how long did it take? Nothing, right? To create this, uh, maybe an hour. Uh, there is a try and error. So uh, I did do a bit of try and error to get to this uh, outcome, but it's really all very intuitive. Um, and so what are the key principles of prompt engineering? So the pr first principle, write clear and specific instructions with detailed contents and relevant information. So here, being concise uh, when you do prompt engineering isn't an advantage. So 
Short-term instructions are often not better. Okay, principle two, chain of thought. For complex tasks, give the model time to think. How do you do it? Prompt them to have internal monologues. We don't want a split-second uh, answer. You know that if there is something complicated, and I will ask you the question, and you'll give your split-second uh, answer, your blip answer, often it will not be the right one. So, you, and if I'll tell you, why don't you think about it step by step and break it, break it up into tasks, you might actually get much closer to the answer. So the same is, goes with ChatGPT. Uh, so for complex tasks, simply adding, let's think step by step, improved result from 20% to 80%. So this is really amazing, okay? Uh, how difficult is prompt-based AI? So as we said, it's very, very easy. Andrew and G says minutes, to hours, I would say days, okay? Still, it's amazingly simple. It's, uh, you don't have to invest in infrastructure to, to, to experiment. It's all out there, okay? Uh, uh, so prompt based AI is great. It's a faster time to market and less that required expert. However, it's always a but. By itself, it's not enough for developing complex app or for building a proprietary LLM application for your organization. What do I mean? I had, in the previous example, I had a menu which was short, but what if it was much, much longer, a more complex menu, okay? What if, what, what, if it wasn't a, 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 you know, a restaurant, it was, a, it was let's say, a, a very large retail store with a, millions of options, okay? Then I couldn't put it in the prompt. What is it if it's something based on your own uh, sla uh, your own org organization, Slack messages, emails, it won't fit in the context window uh, of ChatGPT, okay? Uh, what if it's very uh, sensitive information and you don't, for your own reason, you don't trust uh, uh, it to be hosted not, on, uh, you know, uh, uh, not on your organization or, uh, let's say, on Amazon, you don't trust, let's say, uh, OpenAI or Cohere for your own reasons, then for all those reasons, you would want to use a, an external database with your proprietary data uh, and uh, index in a way that the relevant information would be put at the right time uh, in the prompt for ChatGPT like a large language model to answer. So enter retrieval augmentation for LLM with embeddings and vector database. So retrieval augmentation is not just with vector databases. It's also with SQL databases, for real-time data from Google search, graph databases. But here I'm going to focus more on vector databases, which are really essential when dealing with unstructured data. You know, data like text and uh, extracting uh, information from data like text or images or audio, etc. And I also uh, talked about developer-friendly frameworks for language models, which make it much, much uh, uh, user-friendly and faster time to market, the same way with neural search framework here in number four for vector similarity search. So this is also from Andres Capacity OpenAI State of GPT talk from several months ago. He talks about that using search is retrieval only. Using LLM without, you know, all the context data, then it's we rely on the mem memory only. And if that if ChatGPT has this information, what is the, the capital of uh, London, uh, uh, sorry, what is the capital of the United Kingdom? London, you know, it has this information. You don't need to feed it uh, with external data of all the, the capital cities of all the states in the world because it knows it already. But for when it doesn't have this information in memory, then you give it the relevant information, often using uh, embeddings, APIs to index chunks in a vector store. Okay, and you can see here on the left Lama index, and they show those vector stores, but also they show other databases and other APIs to other sources of information, if it's Slack or Google search, etc. Now, a large language models with vector database or large language model, models with retri retri retrieval augmentation or RAG, retrieval augmentation generation. So, hello. To stop hallucination, you feed the model with relevant facts and data. Trained on all data, we know that there is a limitation. You train the foundation model on, on tons of data, and then uh, the data is frozen. It doesn't get 
updated data, so feed the model with fresh and real-time data. Limited input, input lags, the context window is limited. Overcome limit by using efficient indexing with vector similarity search. Limited chat memory, again, with external database, you don't have this limitation. Access to my proprietary data, put your proprietary data on an external vector database that you control and you won't have to uh, worry about security and privacy so much, and it will make your application much more relevant and powerful, like creating a customized LLM, a customized ChatGPT. No preference uh, or proprietary ChatGPT. No reference are provided. Snippets of data from query to database are provided as references. So if you see a result and you want to know what is this result based on, so all the snippets of data that you used in the query, you can, uh, you can reference as the sources. Produce harmful or toxic content. Grounded LLMs produce less toxic content. Plus, we can use vector similarity search for input or output screening moderating, the same way that ve vector similarity search is used for anomaly detection or fraud, fraud detection or, or content moderation. Vector database can provide the memory, the knowledge base, and embedding search to help address generative AI shortcoming, in summary. So how does this work in practice? The first step is we load the database, load the vector database. We generate embeddings and load ingest to the vector database. So let's say we have many documents. Those documents are um, research papers or they are a product catalog, whatever they are. We split them into chunks, let's say paragraphs. And we generate an embedding per each paragraph using the embedding generator. Then we load index and store this vector embedding in the vector database. Once we have that, we generate embedding for a question and then query vector database to get most relevant uh, context. So we have a question. Let's say um, um, it's, a, it's a question about, uh, I would like to buy uh, this type of product, okay? We generate an embedding um, and we run a similarity search against the embeddings of all the products in the product catalog. And then we get the relevant contest chunks, okay? And once we have that, we insert the question plus those chunks, maybe it's the relevant descriptions from the top most relevant products into the LLM and then a uh, ChatGPT or another lar large language model will give us a, an answer in a, you know, in a chat-like, human-like answer. Uh, and if we want the references, we just refer back to those chunks as the sources. Um, so some people, uh, including me, were very excited about models that were uh, published, uh, available with much larger context window. So uh, Mixtra that I mentioned earlier has a, a 30,000 context window, which is quite a lot. Uh, Anthropic uh, Cloud, uh, about half a year ago, uh, published uh, with 100,000 tokens, and now, just recently, with 200,000 tokens. So this is really great. It's about 150,000 words, but it has a trade-off, okay? If uh, you put all the data in the context, it's instead of just putting the relevant data in the context, then it will cost you more money. If you are using API, they charge per token, so it will cost you much more money. If you are hosting the uh, open source LLM uh, you, uh, by yourself, then you will, it will cost you more uh, computing, hardware cost, storage cost. Um, uh, it, it won't be efficient. Uh, because it's, uh, there will be an issue uh, with latency, okay? Uh, so it, the performance won't be good. And in terms of accuracy, will it give me the relevant results? There are papers, like lost in the middle, that show that uh, as long as the answer is in the beginning or the end, then the answers are, are good. But if it's somewhere in the middle, then uh, often the results are not as accurate. So, uh, and another reason is 150K words is a lot, but it's still not nearly enough for many, many use cases. Okay, um, so here are examples for vector databases uh, that are used as memory and knowledge base for LLM frameworks. So we have Langchain, which is the most uh, popular one. 
Uh, we have Lambda IDX, which is also very popular, OpenAI, of course, ChatGPT uh, memory, and Stack AI, which is a no-code platform for building LLM applications. Um, all of them use vector database uh, um, uh, under the hood, okay, or also vector databases. Uh, here we have example for uh, user-facing uh, application or use cases. So AutoGPT, uh, the very, very popular AI agent for autonomous task completion. So you give it a task, it breaks it into subtasks, and it goes to the internet, it manipulates files. And, you know, this is the future, and it's mind-blowing. It was the first AI agent, I think. Bloop, which is a more uh, established, uh, I think, uh, production ready, and I'll say why, uh, or enterprise ready application. Navigating large code base, finding code and get explanation record in natural language. This is like the, the opposite of co-pilot, okay? Uh, and uh, AppSumo, a chat bot that is called AskSumo for the app marketplace for entrepreneurs. Uh, Ask Seneca, conversation with Seneca, ancient Rome philosopher, okay? Uh, so I test drove all of these uh, use cases to see how they perform. Uh, Ask Sumo, what are some of the alternatives to Zoom for running webinars? It gave me a nice answer uh, in, in natural language. Uh, I like the answer. It, it just took, uh, you know, many seconds. And, and I think that, and that was, I checked several months ago. It might be now that the performance is better, but it's important to, to also uh, pay attention to performance. And here we have a, a, a question that I asked Bloop. What happens if a user does and does this and that? Okay. Uh, so uh, Bloop uh, gave an answer. It read the code, understood my question, natural language question, and gave me an answer in natural language. So this is very useful for, uh, um, you know, when you have very large um, a code legacy code and uh, it has readability issues or you want to save time. So this is very, very uh, useful. Um, and this is, a, let's say, Ask Seneca. Uh, this, I think this is probably, uh, there is a demo, there is a, there is a blog post how the person who created it created it. Um, I think it took him a weekend to create it. Uh, should I buy Mazda or Tesla? And the philosopher Seneca, who's obviously not alive, is ancient, uh, answered, my friend, you asked me whether you should buy a new Mazda or Tesla, but let me remind you that life is short and uncertain. And, you know, it goes on and on and on and on. And, and if you see the numbers here, one, two, three, four, they are the resources, the references that it used uh, to answer me. So if I want to see the resource, what is this answer based on, I can go back to the references. And for AutoGPT, I asked AutoGPT to create a cyborg uh, in the image, you know, for Elon Musk. And it looks very promising. Uh, it's, it took my task, uh, created subtags, went into the internet, went to apps, manipulated files, and the result was I wasn't very happy. It was several months ago. Maybe now it's better. Uh, I actually had to pay money for it. Not a lot of money, but it, it isn't enterprise ready. It's not production ready. Um, you agree with me, but this is the future. This is mind blowing. It's just the beginning. Uh, so this is amazing. Uh, but I think that the takeaway here that there is a mind blowing potential, but for mission critical application, a lot more work around LLM ops is a must. And there are um, many resources about ML ops and specifically LLM op, large language model uh, operations that uh, you can uh, go through them. And, uh, and study them because if it's easy today to create the magic, like, you know, in the Hogwarts restaurant, the, uh, um, to make it production worthy, you need a lot more work. But this is not just the domain of AI, this is also, uh, you know, DevOps, right? So what is the ecosystem? Uh, on the bottom layer, we have the a large, a large language model models, which is, you know, the magic, what, what, without it, nothing would have been possible. The one in uh, bold are the open source ones, or open, open source and open models. Then the vector databases, the large language model frameworks like Lange, Langchain, Lama Index, that used to be called GPT Index, uh, the embedding models, uh, model repositories. Um, so so um, 
There is um, OpenAI hugging face, Kaggle, but also Cohere, Bedrock, okay? Um, and application business logic and user interface. Now, you, you, if you notice, there are lots of models called by animal names. So uh, we have uh, Vicuna, Alpaca, Koala, and, and it's all, you know, to give respect to Llama, the Facebook model, uh, which was open sourced. And thanks to Llama, all of these mo models are possible. Uh, I mentioned before Mistra, uh, 7 uh, billion parameters and Mixtral, which is about 13 billion parameters. And uh, they are like the newest kid on the block. And, and right now they are publishing amazing uh, models. Uh, Mixtral actually uh, performs pretty much as good as ChatGPT or GPT 3.5, which is, if you remember the first several months for ChatGPT, it was based on 3.5 and this is was good enough to the amazing success that it has. So this is really, really amazing that it's available for free. Um, I mentioned the vector databases. I just wanted to mention that also graph databases are special databases that are becoming a more popular and relevant uh, for specifically for machine learning and large language models. And I think that using both vector databases and graph databases uh, can allow you uh, to get more accurate, more powerful uh, results, more, uh, more wider set of use cases. Um, Langchain orchestrates and abstracts all the complexity between the prompts, the agents, the vector database, it allows you to chain several prompts, sev uh, etc. And, and of course, the large language models and also the graph database. It has a, a 70 stars, here we can see 60, but I checked uh, yesterday, it has about 70 stars on GitHub. So this is really, really uh, popular. Uh, so the degree of difficulty, uh, I would say that uh, in terms of the um, the wider use use cases and more powerful applications and, and the trade-off of complexity, uh, the, uh, the best value would be neural search framework and large, lang la large language model uh, frameworks. So neural search frameworks like Gina AI and large language models like Llama Index and, uh, and Langchain. Uh, uh, but it's important to note that all of this is in the context of text right, large language models. If you are dealing with images or audio, then you won't be able to use a large language model frameworks. Uh, you would use, uh, I would say, uh, what I circled in, uh, in red, neural search frameworks, uh, because they are good for any modality. Uh, uh, embeddings with vector similarity search, again, any modality, and fine tuning with classic supervised learning. So the future is here. Uh, you can see, right? It's it's here. It's this this uh, inflection point is bigger than uh, um, than internet, bigger than than uh, cloud computing, bigger than mobile, uh, than IoT, and it's now. Now it doesn't mean that if you're not uh, going after your own startup today, you are going to miss out. I think this is going to be a journey of several years at least. Uh, but it's here, and uh, and it's available for you. So here is an example of, uh, I think, a very useful tool for EdTech that you can very easily uh, develop today. Just an example. So uh, something that I thought of. Um, if you saw before the Ask Seneca, so instead of feeding um, the model with everything that Seneca wrote, you would feed it with everything that Abraham Lincoln wrote. And uh, a student would be able to interact with Abraham Lincoln and think how uh, fun and educational that could be. And this is a, a, m maybe more futuristic and slightly more creepy. Uh, so a Joel type AI built in person's own image for the benefit of next generation. So if you remember, Superman actually talked to his dad, even though his dad, Joel, died thousands of years earlier by talking to an AI built in, the, in his uh, dad's image. So this is something that's also uh, uh, possible uh, today. So most of the building blocks for building new innovative applications and startups already exist and are open source. Now, uh, we can use AI uh, to automate a task that uh, humans uh, did uh, in the past. 
or today uh, uh, but we can uh, we can use AI and this is make makes me more excited to create new business that that were, wasn't possible wasn't cost effective to create before because of the cost of humans uh, let's say it required 10 people but now you can do it with only two people because the other eight are AI so we didn't uh, um, uh, take eight people and and you know stole their jobs uh, quote unquote but we created a, a, a startup that has a job for two people so this is just an illustration and we we, we create we can eight uh, businesses uh, also to address uh, lots of the challenges of this world you know think of a non-profit organization or a social net social uh, ventures uh, that uh, weren't again cost effective to do before uh, so most of the building blocks for building new and innovative applications and startups already exist and are open source. Now, the, the big question that a lot of people are asking, will AI take our jobs? So it uh, will take over our jobs. So this was a question that was asked uh, also uh, after uh, I gave the talk in a panel between several uh, people, and there were different views. And I will share with you uh, my view. So. Will AI take our, over our jobs, specifically software developer jobs? And this is, would be the same discussion that I'm telling you now, would be for lawyers and for uh, maybe doctors and maybe other professions, okay? Uh, so the, the answer is, is yes, okay? Uh, AI uh, will take over uh, our jobs as software developers as they are defined today, okay? So this is the, the important part, as they are defined today. So how do we address it? So first of all, you know, it's, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Uh, for some professions, it's already happening now, like technical writers and private teachers and stuff. But, but, uh, but it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it is going to happen over the next several years, I assume. Uh, definitely 10 years. That's, that's my, my, my take on it. Uh, so what, what do we do about it? Uh, do we ignore AI? Uh, or do we embrace it? So I say embrace it. Think of uh, that you are uh, interviewing for a job, uh, or, or maybe you want to hire a person, a software developer for your team, okay? And one person says, look, I tried AI uh, as, uh, you know, my uh, uh, um, per, um, companion, you know, for, for development, and it had too much mistakes. Uh, was outdated, uh, just a waste of time. And another person says, yeah, I tried it and I found a sweet spot of areas that we work well together or areas that just a waste of my time and it increased my productivity by 50%, let's say, okay? So who would you hire? You know that you would hire the person who embraces AI. Now, um, this is a very uh, similar discussion uh, to um, computers. If you think of what computers are, you are thinking probably uh, of uh, the computer that you are now using. Uh, or maybe if it was uh, many, many years ago, it was a mainframe computer. Uh, but in the 60s, computers were actually the name of a profession, like lawyers, okay? It's a profession. Computers were people who, who made the mathematical uh, calculations for launching rockets to the moon. It usually were uh, women that were very good in mathematics. And what happened was it, uh, once the mainframe was introduced, the mainframe replaced them and, and they didn't have a job as computers, but they did, a lot of them had the jobs as the first programmers of the mainframe. So this is, I think, where we want to be. We want to um, be in a position that when the new job will be created and many new jobs will be created thanks to AI, we will be positioned to uh, um, to be a good or uh, or to go after these uh, roles and jobs. Uh, so that's it. I, and the, the bottom line is innovate or be disrupted. And I think that the fact that you are listening to this talk means that you are uh, you are the ones who want to learn more and to innovate. And uh, so thank you very much for listening to this talk. I am sharing with you a few links. This is the collab that includes all the code uh, that I, that I showed you now in this presentation. Uh, and you can just open it. And if you don't know what is a Google Colab, just just uh, you know, Google it. It's very very easy, and uh, and you'll find many many uh, Colab notebooks out there uh, uh, for many many uh, innovative use cases. 
Uh, here, this is a Google Docs of um, links to courses and resources to learn more. And uh, over the next few days, I might uh, update it with uh, uh, more uh, new links that I shared also in the presentation. Uh, and this is uh, my, my, uh, me on LinkedIn. Let's connect. And again, thank you very much uh, for joining the session. I hope you learned and benefited. And if you have any question, I'd be happy uh, to answer. Thank you very much.